Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our lock, uh, not a lockdown live stream. I say this every time. Welcome to an elephant professional lecture. Uh, today, we're going to be heading back to Myanmar and we are going to be thinking about how elephants think. In fact, we will be pondering pachyderm personalities uh, with Satish Venkatesh, who is um, working with Josh Plotnik, Dr. Josh Plotnik, I should say, who is a, an old friend of the foundation and done a lot of research here and an old friend of mine and the Smithsonian Institution. And we were just discussing actually Satish's time. He spent a lot of time in Thailand previously working up in the mountains above Chiang Mai and knows one of our other elephant professional lecturers, uh, Kerry, who talked a lot about um, elephant food. But rather than elephant food, we're going to be talking about personalities and learning how in the with the Myanmar subset of elephants over there, um, logging elephants, how they how they evaluate the personalities of the elephants and what difference that might make to, to which elephants. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Satish and he will tell you all about it. Good evening, Satish. Well, good morning for you, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's great to join you guys. Um, and I'm excited to talk about some elephant personalities. Let me share my screen here. All right, so as John said, uh, my name is Satish Bekatesh, and I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about my work uh, using Puzzle Box to study elephant personalities in Myanmar. Uh, this work is done uh, in conjunction with two different groups. Uh, the Comparative Cognition for Conservation Lab at Hunter College with Dr. Joshua Plotnik and the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, uh, along with uh, Dr. Schiffler Goldenberg. Um, I'll go over a brief bit about animal personality in general, uh, and then uh, a little bit specifically about how we test these, uh, how we test animal personality, and how we tested animal personality with these elephants. Uh, in so before I go too much into my talk, I wanted to point out uh, two previous lectures uh, with the uh, 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 professional lecture series that I've done here. Um, these two talks actually cover very similar topics to uh, my topic, um, but they cover it in a slightly different way. So. Uh, Sarah Jacobson and so Sasha Montero's talk uh, talks about elephant personalities. Um, they also work in my lab at Hunter College, and uh, they look at uh, elephant personality in wild elephants in Thailand, and I'll talk a little bit about them. Uh, and then also Dr. Martin uh, Saltzman's talk, uh, which talks about elephant personality uh, in the same uh, Miami timber elephants that I'm working with. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, but uh, as I said, they cover similar topics. So I won't go into too much detail uh, repeating what they went over because they do a great job of explaining some of those intricacies about personality and then also some of the details about uh, Myanmar timber elephants. So definitely go uh, check out uh, their talks as well if uh, you're interested in uh, some, of that, some of those topics. So first, uh, the question I have is, what is personality? In general, when we think about personality, we usually think about uh, personality humans, and we usually think about kind of those extreme versions of personality, either those that are really exuberant or exaggerated, uh, or those that are kind of laid back, calm, and relaxed. Um, so these kind of personalities here. Um, and then also we usually can uh, diagnose our own personality or we usually try to spend a good amount of time trying to diagnose our own personality. So usually if we're thinking about personality, first off, we're usually thinking of personality in people and how we assess personality in ourselves. Um, we can ask people questions about um, how they're thinking and how they're feeling. Uh, so in terms of personality, it's easier to kind of establish personality because we're able to, you know, ask them questions, uh, gauge what they're feeling and thinking, and compare that to how their actions are uh, to give us a good idea of what their individual personality is. But with animals, we don't really have this uh, true ability to ask questions or kind of get inside the mind of an animal, one, because uh, we're not able to physically have a conversation with uh, animals, 
And the other way is, uh, the other reason is because animals often have a very different perception as us. So really understanding how they think and feel uh, might be very different to how we kind of perceive that same world. Uh, so this presents a number of different challenges uh, when we're thinking about animal personality. So with animal personality, uh, most people now would probably agree that animals have personality. Um, and uh, I'm sure most of the people that are tuning into this uh, and that have seen John's live streams might have seen or ascribed personalities to different elephants that they've seen often uh, in some of these live streams and that we see in different situations. Uh, but typically when we're talking about animal personality, uh, what people think about the most is personalities and their own pets. So we might see them as playful or uh, very social. We might see them as silly or naughty or getting into trouble. Uh, we might see them as grumpy or aloof or not interested in us, or we might see them as aggressive or dangerous. Um, and when we're talk talking about animal personalities, uh, recognizing them within our pets or animals that we have had long-term relationships uh, with is something that's easy to do because we've established that long-term relationship with these individuals. We know them over a long period of time, and we kind of get an idea for what that personality is. In the same way, uh, scientists kind of have spent long periods of time observing animals in the wild or in captivity in zoos. Uh, and they're able to gauge personality based off of experience and understanding over a long period of time. Um, typically, when we're, when we're looking at our pets and we're looking at what their personality is, this is a very kind of informal, uh, very variable way of understanding personality where, you know, one person might have one definition for what they think an animal is and another person might have a different definition. So, uh, in order to establish personality in animals and in personality, especially in animals in the wild, uh, we need to come up with a more consistent kind of in, um, more formal and objective way of understanding personality and rating personality uh, in animals. Uh, so first off, uh, we need to understand exactly what personality types and traits there are and then come kind of cut come to a consensus on exactly uh, what those personality traits that we're going to categorize uh, animals into. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that you can classify personality, but these are five of the main personality traits uh, that are typically seen within animals. Uh, now, these also there's also some personality traits that we see with people, and there's a way of rating and kind of uh, separating those personality traits. And you can see from this list here of these five that it's slightly different um, than what we'd usually find with people. So with animals, we usually divide personality traits into these five, and then there's kind of subgroups of these five that kind of appear and uh, separate. Um, so the first one that we have here is exploration or avoidance. So usually exploration is uh, animals exploring an environment or an object or something new, uh, learning about it, understanding about it. And avoidance is typically uh, either neophobia or neophilia, where an animal is either uh, averse or attracted to something that's new. Um, a couple of ways you can test this are with an open field test, which is a animal is in a new environment and you see how it explores that environment. Um, another way, which I'll talk more about later, is a novel object test where you see how an animal uh, explores or interacts with a new, um, new novel object or uh, food or uh, location. The next one that we have here is activity. So activity is usually your coding activity, how much they move around, how much their movement is, how much uh, they interact with different things and uh, where they go. So usually this is a measure of how much activity the individual has. And after that, we have uh, boldness. Boldness is typically used uh, in the context of some sort of threat. So uh, boldness would be like a threat of a predator uh, in which where the individual or animal is 
uh, exposed to some sort of threat, like a predator or a type of predator, uh, and you see how bold they are to approach it or um, how fast they react and um, run away from it. You can also do this somewhat with an emergence, uh, sorry, uh, with an uh, open field test where you uh, expose the individual to a uh, new uh, area and you see how long it takes for them to adjust to or go into that new uh, area. Uh, and then again, also with this, you can do it with a novel object test sometimes where uh, you'll uh, kind of classify how much it interacts with that novel object or how likely it is to interact with that novel object. Uh, and then uh, the last two are both uh, traits that are usually defined within a social context. So the first one is aggressiveness, where you're um, rating the reaction to another individual or uh, how much aggressive actions or uh, kind of like fighting uh, reactions that they have when introduced to other individuals or in a, some sort of social context. Um, sometimes you can test this with a mirror test where you expose uh, some uh, animal to a mirror and you see their reaction to the mirror. Um, but typically this is done in the context of a social context where you have individuals together and you see how they react to each other. Uh, and then the last one is sociability. Uh, so this one you typically are looking at how uh, agreeable or how much time individuals spend to each other and how much they interact with uh, other individuals. Um, and for this, uh, again, this is also usually something that happens in a social context and in some ways you can kind of see it as the opposite of aggressiveness where you're looking at how much interaction an individual has with other individuals. Um, this doesn't necessarily have to include aggression. It could just be some individuals are solitary and some individuals are more sociable or uh, interact more often with other individuals. So now that we know more or less what kind of classifications for personality types that we have, uh, we need to know exactly how do we define personality in kind of a formal way, which is consistent, um, which is a a way that we are able to kind of quantify personality in a way that we can measure. Um, and one way that scientists do this is by using, uh, so one def definition that scientists use for this is uh, personality is consistent or repeatable inter-individual differences in behavior across time and context. Um, in short, that basically is that means that uh, we're, able to see behaviors in an individual that are repeated or they will react in the same way in a different context. So uh, if, uh, which I'll talk more about this later, but if an elephant is uh, exposed to a new object or a new, uh, a new, yeah, say new object or a new food, uh, we can, and uh, at first they're afraid of it, you can assume that most likely that individual will be afraid of that object in a different context. So that's what we're looking for is seeing if an individual is uh, consistently acting the same way to the same sort of stimulus, uh, same, same sort of stimulus. Um, with that, we want to see that individuals are consistent um, with this behavior in different contexts, but also, we have to remember that sometimes uh, over time, uh, some of these behaviors will change or in different contexts, these behaviors will change. So uh, we want to be able to measure these into individual differences across different times and contexts. Um, so one of the ways that scientists are able to quantify this is by with a score of repeatability or R. Um, and this is basically just a score that we can use uh, in order to uh, quantify personality across different studies uh, in order to compare those studies. And sometimes this can be done between species as well. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about repeatability later when I talk about some of the results. 
So why is it important to uh, understand about personality in animals? Uh, and why does that really have sometimes, why do we think that might be important to conservation and how we conserve animals? Um, so one of the things that we you know is personality is particularly important to us uh, to understand in terms of animal cognition. Ideally, all animals kind of act the same and we're able to manage them in the same way. In reality, we know animals are kind of all over the place. You'll have some animals that act the same way, but some animals will act completely different. Um, in the past and uh, how we kind of view animals in the past and how we kind of analyzed animal data, we typically looked for kind of common trends with those animals and made management decisions based off of those common trends, which was typically animals that are kind of the average, um, the average behavior for those group of animals. Um, this typically, uh, any animals that would, uh, any animals that were viewing that were kind of on the outside or outliers, uh, kind of at the extreme ends of those behaviors, were usually discounted as kind of outliers and weren't really considered. Um, but these outliers can be really important because these could actually be uh, variations in personality or quite different personalities on different ends of the spectrum. Uh, one, one reason why these outliers could be really important and why understanding personality uh, could be also very important to conservation is because sometimes these outliers uh, that are at the extremes could be more adaptive or more successful than other individuals that are in the center. So uh, certain personalities have been shown to be more reproductively successful or have better survival success. Uh, for instance, in a conservation kind of uh, example, uh, if you're reintroducing, say, a wolf to a new environment uh, and you want to understand if uh, you may, so yeah, say you're introducing a wolf to a new environment um, and you're looking at uh, how neophobic that wolf is. So how much that wolf is likely to uh, avoid new things. Um, with that, we want to understand that if that wolf is avoiding new things, it's most likely going to avoid, say, human, so um, human habitations, uh, People or um, people or new situations. So, if there's a trap or a, a new road or something like that, uh, a wolf that's introduced that's neophobic might be might have better survival because it might be uh, more timid or more um, more likely to avoid those. Um, new and um, possibly risky situations. So when we're reintroducing animals or talking about uh, how animals adjust to different habitats, personality and knowing variations of personality can be very important in, in terms of how we make decisions and what individuals we manage in the wild. Um, saying that as well, uh, we have to remember that personalities, some personalities can be beneficial in one species, uh, but could have the opposite uh, benefit in another species. So, for instance, a bold lion may be more reproductively successful and have uh, more offspring, but a bold mouse might be too, might cause the mouse to be too risky or, um, uh, or engage in more risky situations. Um, that causes it to have lower survival rates. So while boldness in lions could be beneficial to the species or to the individual, uh, boldness in a mouse might not be, uh, not be as beneficial. So when we do talk about different personalities, we have to remember that uh, these personalities are, could be, uh, have to be species specific when we talk about them, and we have to uh, understand these personalities in uh, different contexts as well. So overall, uh, one of the reasons why personality is, in, in, is important is just in, uh, assessing personalities in a nuanced way uh, is allowing us to understand why variation personality, uh, why there are variations in uh, individuals in a population 
and what those variations mean to the survival of the species and the survival of the different individuals. So why should we focus on elephant personality in particular? Uh, for one reason, we know elephants are very, are very complex, socially cognitive species, and they're very uh, socially complex as, as well. Uh, we know that there's uh, variations in wild populations and how they behave. Um, and we know that they're very important species to different ecosystems that they live in, uh, having significant impacts on both the wildlife around them, the, uh, the land around them, and also uh, the people that live in the areas that they inhabit. Um, one of the biggest uh, variations that we see when we're talking about uh, personality in elephants is that we see uh, there are some elephants that we see that have the, uh, sorry, there are some elephants that um, are more frequent problematic elephants uh, to say, to kind of give it a general term. But in general, we know that some elephants uh, cause more problems or uh, crop rate or go into people's fields more often than others. We're not really exactly sure why there's some individuals that crop rate more often than others. And, uh, we, and understanding why there's some individuals that are more likely or more prone to do this would be able to, would help us uh, in terms of managing those individuals that are causing problems with people. Uh, there's a few studies that say that uh, these crop raiders or individuals that are more likely to crop raid uh, could be due to different demographic variations. So for instance, age or sex could be an influence that causes uh, individuals to crop raid more. So maybe males crop raid more or maybe younger individuals crop raid more. Um, so there's a few uh, studies that suggest that maybe those are possibilities. Um, but in addition to that, we also, uh, it could also be that there's variations in individuals' differences or variations in personality where certain personality types uh, uh, crop rated more often. And it could be that those personality characteristics can kind of define or help us uh, locate or identify individual crop raiders that, or individuals that are more likely to cause problems. So talking a little bit about human-elephant conflict. Um, so space is finite, especially for elephants um, and especially for elephants in Asia. Um, Asia has one of the largest growing populations and also one of the one of the areas of wild land that is shrinking drastically. Uh, both humans and elephants need a huge amount of resources and take up a huge amount of resources. And due to this, uh, both humans and elephants are competing typically for the same type of space. Um, this creates a number of different problems. Um, one of those is crop rating, where elephants enter human land and uh, eat crops. Um, that people are planting. While on the farmer's side, this might feel like the elephants are attacking them or are doing it on purpose or more aggressive uh, because they might lose an entire harvest in one night where an elephant or a group of elephants come into a, a farm field and is able to eat an entire uh, season's worth of food in one night. Um, that That's more from a from the farmer's perspective and definitely is really a major concern for them. Uh, but from the elephant's perspective, uh, elephants are always uh, looking for food, always eating food. And uh, in terms of a crop field, especially a crop field that is right at harvest, um, is a very palatable and highly nutritious food source. So in terms of the elephant's perspective, they might just be taking advantage of a very palatable, easy food source where there's a large concentration of highly palatable food in one location, and they're taking advantage of that in terms of a survival or a, a evolutionary um, and an evolutionary idea where they're trying to maximize their effort for their gain for intake. So 
people have come up with a number of different mitigation methods of ways of scaring or keeping uh, elephants out of fields. Um, there's a number of different ways that people do this, typically scaring away elephants, making loud noises, uh, popping firecrackers. Um, there's kind of some more extreme versions where uh, there's uh, lights or uh, uh, really loud firecrackers or uh, large groups of people chasing elephants. Um, also, people have come up with ditches and fences and uh, even bee fences or chili fences. Uh, but overall, uh, a lot of these mitigation methods over time, uh, elephants are cognitively aware and cognitively, cognitively adaptable, uh, where they understand them and they're able to find out ways to get past them over time. So a lot of these mitigation methods, although they are quite uh, successful initially, over time they're unsuccessful or uh, elephants are uh, finding uh, ways to get past them. So one of the possible solutions that people have suggested is uh, tailoring solutions uh, to individuals. So instead of tailoring solutions that kind of affect elephants or a group of elephants as a whole, so saying, okay, we know elephants are cooperating in this field, we wanna keep out all the elephants and we're gonna put up an electric fence that kind of keeps out all elephants. Um, it would be more tailoring solutions to specific locations where we know elephants cooperate more or specific individuals. So if uh, resources are an issue and you know there's an individual, there's a prominent cooperator in an area, uh, you could tailor or concentrate your mitigation methods to that area where the individual is. Or you could also uh, kind of adapt or develop mitigation methods that are kind of tailored to the personality types or the ways in which those individuals in that area behave. And I'll go into that a little bit more uh, later as well. So different types of tests. So there's uh, typically there's three different ways that you can uh, diagnose or understand uh, kind of, not uh, understand, sorry, uh, assess elephant personality. Uh, the first one is trait rating, uh, which I'll give you an example of. The second one is behavioral coding, uh, where you're kind of uh, coding different behaviors of an individual uh, and assessing their personality based on a record of those behaviors. And the last one is experimental, which I'll talk about more uh, as well uh, later on. So the first one is trait rating. And a good example of trait rating is actually uh, talked about with uh, Dr. S uh, Saltzman's um, talk, uh, where he, uh, he assessed the personality in uh, Myanmar timber elephants um, by supplying a questionnaire to Mahouts and Mahout leaders. Uh, so this questionnaire was, uh, I think, a 28 uh, a 28 question survey where Mahouts and Mahout leaders assessed uh, Myanmar uh, elephant personality based on previous knowledge and a long-term understanding and relationship with these individuals. Um, by assessing their personality, they were able to identify different personality types uh, within these individuals. Uh, some of the different personality types that they uh, specified were attentiveness, sociability, and aggressiveness. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about this study, but uh, definitely take a, a look at their talk uh, in order to understand more about trait rating and uh, some of their tests. Uh, they also, because they were using the Myanmar and Timber elephants, they were also able to have a very large sample size uh, for assessing personality where they had over 200 individuals, I think over 250 individuals that they uh, were able to assess personality with, which is very difficult to do in, uh, with other groups of elephants or populations. Uh, behavioral coding. Uh, one good example of behavioral coding, coding is also uh, Sarah Jacobson and Sasha Montero's talk. Uh, where uh, a lot of their observations are done with camera traps, 
uh, either with camera traps near watering holes or direct observation near food fields. Um, one of the big uh, issues that you get when you're, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and uh, with these elephants that they're looking at, they're looking at wild elephants. Uh, and one of the biggest issues you have with uh, understanding or assessing personality in wild elephants is you need to be able to identify all of those individuals in order to consistently uh, follow behaviors for that individual to assess their personality. So the first step of that would obviously be uh, identifying different individuals so you can follow them uh, in those videos or in multiple videos in different locations. Um, and in addition to that, they did uh, behavioral coding where they watch behaviors over a period of time and assess an individual's personality or how they move or interact with other individuals uh, through behavioral coding of those behaviors. Um, in addition to this, they did a little bit of an experimental, uh, they also did experimental testing where they have puzzle boxes with different solutions and they see how uh, different individuals interact with or uh, innovate uh, in order to get into those puzzle boxes. And some of the personality types that they're looking at, uh, and you can uh, watch their talk for a little bit more detail, they're looking at neophobia, neophilia, uh, so how uh, likely individuals are to approach or uh, interact with new objects or how, um, yeah, and uh, also sociability and aggressiveness uh, in a social context. So one of the reasons why uh, experimental tests in the wild are difficult is they're typically uh, done where you have an individual or a species or an animal, and you bring that animal into the lab and you assess uh, that animal's uh, personality or behavior in a very controlled setting. So obviously with an animal like a mouse, uh, you're able to move this animal around uh, in a very easy way. And you can introduce it to things like this uh, y maze test where an animal is introduced into an environment and they, uh, you see which way they move and how long they spend in different uh, sections. But uh, for elephants, this is obviously a lot more difficult to do. Uh, because they're so much bigger. So bringing an elephant into a lab is obviously not possible. You can do experimental tests, uh, which Dr. Plotnick does in quite a lot of uh, examples with elephants in a kind of controlled uh, situation where uh, you're in an open area. Uh, this example that I have here for elephants is a Y maze that we built for some of the elephants uh, in Myanmar, where they're doing a similar test to uh, the mouse here, but um, obviously you have to make it a lot larger and a lot more robust in order to um, develop these tests for an elephant. So typically tests with elephants uh, that are doing experimental tests are done in a very controlled situation in a specific location or in a zoo. And um, from, from our studies before, and uh, from some, uh, when we're looking at individuals in general, we know that captive elephants, uh, especially captive elephants in zoos, probably act very differently than wild elephants uh, that are in a wild environment. Um, we also saw this as well. We did some pre-testing with some of the elephants at the National Zoo, and uh, the elephants of the National Zoo had very different reactions um, to our puzzle box, which I'll talk about later, than uh, the elephants in Myanmar did. So we do know that uh, elephants in the wild and elephants in captivity don't always in interact or react the same to the same situations. And uh, in addition to that, if you're talking about elephants in say Africa and elephants in India or elephants in Asia somewhere, um, those elephants might also have very different reactions to different situations. So. We do have to kind of look at these different species or different groups and in the context that they are and kind of test them where they are as well. Um, and with us, with our group of elephants that we're going to work with, that I'm going to talk about now, um, one of the nice things about them 
especially when we're considering how difficult it is to test elephants in the wild, but also have that kind of wild context, is the group of elephants that we're working with is a semi-wild group of elephants, which I'll talk about. So they kind of cross over a little bit between that captive environment where you're able to control and monitor and have a consistent repeatability or um, with, with those tests and also a wild environment where the elephant displays or uh, is able to move in a wild context uh, and you're able to assess it also in that wild kind of context as well. Um, so, as I said, uh, kind of this crossover between the two groups of wild and captive is a semi-wild group of elephants that we're working with, and uh, these elephants are with the Myanmar Timber Enterprise. I won't go into too much detail about the Myanmar Timber Enterprise because uh, Dr. Saltzman uh, does a very good job of talking about in detail about all the intricacies about the Amamo Timber Enterprise and how the elephants are managed. Um, but overall, I'll give you a little brief background of it. So the elephants that work with the Amamo Timber Enterprise are all uh, working in the timber industry where they're made to move logs uh, from, from one area to another. Um, they're typically working in a forest environment and um, in addition to that, they're kind of uh, partially governmentally managed. This is actually the largest uh, captive population of elephants in the world. So there's about 3,000 elephants that are part of uh, the Mambo Timber Enterprise. Uh, and in addition to that, because they're sort of governmentally run over a number of years, uh, they have very consistent uh, good records of the elephants and they actually have fairly good uh, like consistent uh, care. So because they're kind of consistently managed and consistently, uh, well, for the most part, consistently managed and consistently uh, trained and uh, worked with, they have very good records. And then also they have very consistent uh, um, kind of upbringing uh, in terms of how they're uh, trained and what behaviors they, they're taught. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, these elephants are semi-wild elephants. So this means that they spend their day in uh, the camps in Myanmar, uh, the timber camps where they'll work in the camps, uh, moving uh, trees uh, or whatever activities that they need to do for those camps. Um, typically, most of the day they'll forage in the forest. So they still are working in a wild environment where they're working in a forest. So uh, quite often when they're moving from place to place, uh, they will forage freely, or they will forage uh, in that wild environment and a good portion of their food, both day and night does come from the forest. Um, in some cases during the day, especially depending on how much they're working, they'll have supplemental food during the day as well. Um, at night though, what makes these uh, group of elephants semi-wild is they're actually released into the forest where they're able to uh, freely move in the forest at night. Uh, they'll interact with each other. And also sometimes if there's wild elephants in that area, they'll interact with wild elephants. Um, in addition, uh, they'll kind of breed and, uh, and interact with each other in the forest at night. Um, and also in addition with wild elephants. With the semi-wild group of elephants, we do have some captive born elephants where elephants are born in captivity, uh, but we also have some wild born elephants where um, prior to uh, a ban on capturing elephants from the wild uh, for the timber industry, um, there were some elephants that were brought into this uh, timber industry from the wild. Uh, so we do have a variation in terms of elephants that were born in captivity and elephants that were born in the wild. Um, and this could affect possibly their behavior uh, and how they're trained and how they're raised. So those are all important things to consider when we're talking about the semi-wild species or semi-wild group of elephants. 
Um, also, one thing that's really interesting about these semi-wild group elephants is when they are moving freely in the forest, um, quite often they're also near uh, human land or human fields, and they will crop raid. So quite a high percentage of the uh, individuals do crop raid as well at some point during their time. Uh, and there is variations where some individuals crop raid more often than others. So with this system of semi-wild animals uh, to test, it's really interesting because we have that controlled ability where we can work with them during the day, kind of do controlled uh, experimental tests. And then also at night, we kind of have that free ranging wild movement and we do have that crop rating behavior. So we're able to uh, compare uh, some of this data that we're getting from the behavioral tests with uh, the movement data or the uh, wild movement kind of behavior that we're seeing. And we're able to see, you know, do these tests that we're doing uh, with these elephants behaviorally um, relate to how they move in the forest and how uh, they interact with people in the wild. So with our group of elephants, uh, we tested actually, we tested uh, 29 elephants on a problem solving test. Overall, we tested actually 31. Uh, but only 29 of them uh, used our puzzle box, which I'll talk a little bit about. So the camps that we worked with, we worked in two different camps in Myanmar. Uh, the first one was in the northern region, uh, and the second one was in the southern region, actually in the Bago region, which is quite near uh, Yangon, which is the main city. And uh, these camps were kind of divided up in the northern region. Uh, they were divided up into four different camps that were kind of close together. So we actually tested all the individuals uh, in two locations here. Uh, and in the southern region, they were all centered in one area and in one camp um, in the southern region. So how do we test personality? So there's a number of different ways that we can test personality uh, and assess different types of personalities. Um, and one of the, I won't go into all of the different ways or different tests that we can uh, test personality in, but uh, I'm specifically gonna talk about one of the ones that we used, which is uh, the use of a novel object. So with a novel object, we're able to uh, assess uh, an individual's personality by experimenting testing how they approach this object. Uh, so it's a new object that they haven't seen before and we're able to see how they explore it and how they interact with it. And also uh, how, um, yeah, so how they approach and interact with it and also how uh, likely they are to approach it or even interact with it at all. Uh, and this does have some parallels to how they act in the wild. So basically a novel object test is, uh, can, be model, can model how an individual will act in a wild situation. So we can expect that an individual that interacts or is more likely to interact or explore a novel object in a wild situation would actually uh, be more exploratory or uh, would also be more likely to approach novel situations or unusual situations like with people. So for our specific animals with these uh, semi-wild elephants here, it's really interesting because we're able to conduct these novel object tests uh, where we have this novel object and this interaction with a new object and we're able to test them on uh, different things like exploration and neophobia. Uh, but we're also able to measure their wild movements and see, do uh, they still consistently have these personality types or variations in personality that we see uh, when they interact with this novel object? And are these also uh, directly paralleled to how they move in a wild situation or a wild context? Um, so some of the different tests that I have here uh, with wild, uh, sorry, with uh, different species. Uh, we have a test that was done with, with uh, hyenas that assesses personality and related to human disturbance. So similar kind of to the study that we're looking at where we're looking at elephant personality in terms of human disturbance or human interaction. Um, this study with hyenas, they looked at uh, juvenile, juveniles living in low disturbance areas 
uh, and they found that juveniles living in low disturbance areas were more neophobic uh, and less exploratory than those living in high disturbance areas. Uh, another study looked at grackles, uh, which were caught in the wild. Uh, they tested them also on a novel problem solving task, uh, and they found that innovators or individuals that found new solutions or uh, were able to come up with new solutions had a higher exploration um, scores and also uh, had lower uh, object neophobia. So they were um, not as afraid of the new objects uh, than the non-innovators were. Uh, and the last one, which is at the bottom here, uh, is uh, a study that was done with meerkats and looking at uh, social context of novel problem solving uh, with these meerkats. And they found uh, that uh, individuals, uh, there might be specific individuals within the group uh, that are socially more, that are more innovative. And then this social, con in a social context, these innovators uh, in influence others uh, in the group to innovate as well. So the two traits that we're looking at uh, that we measured for this test are exploration and neophobia. So uh, I'll define exploration and neophobia briefly, uh, but exploration is basically uh, the ability to, or the behavior where you're looking at how an individual explores or assesses uh, some new object or some uh, new environment. So you're seeing how much they interact with or move in an environment uh, to assess what their exploration is. Uh, this is often linked to success. So uh, individuals that are more likely to explore uh, typically have higher success. So uh, in a wild context, you can consider this as uh, individuals that, uh, in, that explore or uh, go into more varied environments or look for more resources more, um, typically have higher probability of finding those resources. Uh, in the context of this test, uh, where we have a puzzle box, individuals that are exploring more typically will also have higher success, success at getting at that reward that's inside the puzzle box. Um, and with this, we assess this with an exploration diversity score, where we assess how many unique behaviors an individual performs. So how many unique exploratory behaviors an individual uh, performs in order to get into that box. Uh, and we score an individual based on how many of those unique behaviors that they want. Uh, and again, in a cooperating context, uh, if we're looking at exploration, you can assume that if uh, an elephant comes across a barrier or say an electric fence or a new uh, type of barrier that they're interacting with, individuals that are more likely to explore or, or test this fence or uh, test this new barrier, are uh, more likely to find uh, ways around that barrier and gain access to the food award, which would be uh, the crop field behind it. Uh, the next uh, behavioral trait that we assessed was neophobia. So neophobia is either, uh, so neophobia is the attraction uh, to, or sorry, neophobia is the aversion uh, to a new food source situation or object. Um, the opposite of this would be neophilia, where an individual is uh, attracted to an, a new object, uh, food source, or situation. Uh, and basically, this is kind of an assessment of how likely an individual is, is to accept risk. So how likely are they to approach a, a new object? And you can see this elephant uh, in the bottom right here, which is touching uh, a puzzle box in uh, one of our zoo experiments, where puzzle box moves uh, just a little bit on a slight touch and uh, scares the elephant. So this individual will be more neophobic than an individual that uh, just like comes in and picks up the object or interacts with the object directly. Um, and uh, we typically measure neophobia by time to approach uh, or the time it takes for them to access or uh, uh, successfully gain rewards. Uh, in our study here, we're just measuring time to approach, so the time it takes for the individual to approach the new object. 
in a clock rating sense, uh, as well with neophobia and why it's important to understand uh, neophobia as a personality in elephants. Uh, this could be really important because if we're talking about the tendency for elephants to approach, say, a new barrier or a new object, or uh, elephants to approach a human uh, civilization or a uh, crop field, which may be uh, new to them, or um, possibly could be uh, more uh, varied than they're normally used to. Uh, an individual that's more uh, neophobic would probably be less likely to approach this crop field or, or barrier, uh, whereas uh, an individual that's neophilic would be more likely to uh, interact with or approach this crop field. Uh, similarly, an individual that is neophilic might be more attracted to, say, new or novel food sources. So, for instance, if there's a new crop that's planted or a crop that is more palatable or a crop that's just uh, less known, a neophilic individual might be more likely to uh, be more persistent in uh, accessing that food source. Um, in a conservation context, uh, this is more important because, uh, as I said, uh, some of these individuals that are more exploratory or uh, neophob neophobic uh, might be more or less likely to bypass barriers um, or adapt to barriers or different situations. Uh, similarly to one of the examples that I said before, uh, individuals that are uh, more exploratory or uh, more neophilic uh, might be more adaptive or uh, less adaptive, say, if we're talking about a reintroduction situation where we're reintroducing individuals into the wild, some of those personality traits like neophobia, neophilia, and exploration could be really important in terms of how we assess those individuals that we're releasing into the wild. So uh, for this study particularly, um, we want to ask uh, a question about these two personality traits. So we want to know, uh, do member or timberland elephants show significant variation in these two personality traits, uh, exploration and neophobia, when presented with a novel puzzle? So our two hypotheses, uh, exploration varies significantly between individuals when presented with a novel puzzle and it's consistent within individuals over two trials. So this is basically saying that we do see variations between individuals. So different individuals react differently to the puzzle box uh, and how they explore. Um, but over different trials, when we're testing these individuals with the novel puzzle box, uh, we see that individuals that are consistently uh, so, sorry, we see that individuals that are more exploratory are consistently more exploratory, and individuals that are less exploratory are consistently less exploratory in both trials. Um, and the same thing with neophobia. So, do, uh, neopho does no neophobia vary significantly between individuals when presented with a novel puzzle? And is this consistent within individuals uh, over true trials? Again, with uh, exploration, we're using the exploration diversity score as a measure for uh, this test, uh, for this hypothesis. And for neophobia, we're using the time to approach. So the time it takes for an individual when they're released to approach this novel puzzle. And what we wanna know is, is there variation between individuals and in how fast they approach it? And uh, do individuals uh, that approach the puzzle box say faster, uh, consistently approach it faster over the two trials, or uh, do they uh, vary uh, in, their, in how fast they approach between trials? Um, and ultimately, what we want to know is do these personality traits to uh, relate to how they move in the wild, and uh, do these personality traits also uh, relate to how close they get to, say, human fields or human habitations? So the method that we used, as I said, we used a novel object and we used a puzzle box. Actually, our puzzle box is more of a puzzle tube. So we used a large PVC pipe, which you can see here. Uh, with uh, these elephants in particular and elephants in general, 
it's difficult to make a puzzle box because elephants typically their solution to any problem is to break it. Uh, and they're able to do it with most things where if they're unsure about how to get into it, the easiest way to uh, solve that puzzle or problem is to break it and then uh, they can figure out what's going on after that. Uh, so to create a puzzle box that was uh, the elephants had to come up with a solution other than breaking it, we had to have a very robust PVC pipe, which you can see here. This pipe weighs probably about, uh, I would say like 150 to 200 pounds. Uh, and it basically has three different tasks in it for the elephants to solve. And all three of the tasks are separated within this tube and uh, baited with uh, a different bait. So the baits between the three tasks are all the same, but it has three different um, baits and three different problems that the elephant can solve. Uh, in addition, uh, these are all logging elephants. So uh, interacting with kind of a log shaped object is something that they might be more familiar with. Uh, so we were hoping that that maybe uh, helped with their interaction with the object. Uh, in addition to that, uh, it being a round object instead of a box uh, is beneficial because when uh, the elephant stepped on the object, uh, it kind of dissipated their weight. So it would roll uh, instead of just breaking. Uh, and uh, we had three different tasks with this. We had a reach task, a pull task, and a rip task, which I'll show you in a second. Uh, and each of these tasks were basically um, based on uh, movements or motions that an elephant does in order to forage. Uh, so with that, uh, these uh, behaviors were all uh, how they moved or interacted with the objects. And based on actual foraging strategies in the wild. Uh, so these are the three tasks here. You can see the elephant reaching into uh, this uh, unknown space here to gain the reward where they have to push past a small opening with a rubber uh, cap on it. Uh, the second pull task, they have to pull and extract one tube from another using a chain. Uh, and then the rip task, they have to rip through a large opening here uh, that's covered with paper. Uh, with these elephants in particular, we thought that, oh, sorry, uh, with these tasks in particular, we thought that the rip task with the paper would probably be the easiest since it's the largest opening and the paper is quite easy to break through. Uh, but that's one of the things that we actually saw a pretty big variation with uh, between the captive elephants in the zoo and the elephants in Myanmar, where the Myanmar elephants were very reluctant to interact with the paper, whereas the zoo elephants, it was typically what they first interacted with. Uh, as I said, uh, we use tamarind balls as a reward. So we use uh, tamarind, which is a highly, uh, highly uh, high quality reward where the elephants really like tamarind and salt. Uh, and it's something that's typically used with uh, the elephants and also not very, found very readily in, the, in their natural environment. So it's something that uh, they wouldn't find off the trees or in the forest, uh, at least at this time. And uh, so it's something that the elephants really wanted. So they should be more motivated to get this reward. Um, we ran two trials per elephant uh, for 62 tri total trials for all 31 elephants. Uh, and uh, we did some pre-tests to make sure that elephants could actually solve all three tasks uh, at the National Zoo. Uh, in addition to that, we had some variations. The tasks were the same. Uh, but we just made uh, the test more robust, but the pipe or the puzzle box more robust uh, because the National Zoo elephants found ways to break it. So uh, when we did it in Myanmar, we made it a little bit more uh, robust. And we did test it with a couple elephants in Myanmar as well uh, prior to. Uh, And did uh, with this puzzle box. Uh, we also, as I said, uh, used a exploration diversity score to assess exploration with the individuals. The score ranged between 0 and 11. So there was 11 total uh, unique behaviors that an elephant can perform. So the exploration diversity score could range from 0 to 11. Uh, 
Uh, and for time to approach, uh, we used uh, the time it took from the, when the elephants were released uh, to when they first touched or approached the box. And this ranged uh, anywhere from uh, three seconds, so very fast, to six, uh, 46 minutes, which was almost the entire time that they, that they were allotted to uh, interact with the box. So for analysis, I won't go into too much detail here, um, but feel free to send me any questions if you have any uh, specific interest in the analysis. Uh, but we tested both EDS, which is the exploration diversity score and time to approach uh, as our response variables for a mixed effects model. Uh, in addition to that, so the EDS was our response variable for exploration where uh, it was our way of uh, quantifying their exploration and time to approach was a way of uh, assessing new phobia where uh, the time to, for them to approach was a way of quantifying the phobia. Uh, in order to eliminate some of the uh, other demographic or uh, factors that might influence uh, higher exploration or uh, higher time to approach, uh, slower time to approach. Uh, we included some predictor variables where we use the trial one or two, sex, male or female, age, how old they are, uh, history, which was either wild or captive born, uh, camp, so where they were located, and then the test number as well. And also we included a random effect for individual ID. We got a final value uh, of R for repeatability as well from this, uh, from this analysis. So briefly, I'll go over the results. Uh, we had 11 uh, successful elephants out of the 31 elephants that were successful at gaining at least one reward. Uh, so we did have some elephants that were interacting with the puzzle box, but didn't gain any rewards. Uh, we didn't have any elephants that were actually successful in gaining all three rewards in one single test, uh, but we did have some elephants that were able to get uh, two rewards in one test. Um, and for the different types of rewards, a uh, majority of the uh, elephants that were successful were able to, were successful on the reach task, which was uh, reaching into that unknown space with the rubber on it. Uh, the next one that was that they were most successful with was the full task. And as I said, the rip task, which was covered by the paper, these elephants seem to have a very, um, seem to have an aversion to paper, probably because they're not, they don't interact with it very often. So, uh, the reach task was the least likely to uh, be solved. Uh, and we did also see that more successful elephants did have a higher exploration diversity score. So more exploratory elephants were also more successful at getting into the, to the two, which we would expect. So briefly, I'll talk about the personality results. Oops, sorry, not too far. Uh, so as I said, we had a value of R uh, for, ex for assessing personality. For exploration, this was significant where we did see a significant variation in uh, exploration uh, between individuals. Uh, in addition, uh, this uh, gives us a, uh, analysis, gives us a graph basically, and uh, it's a little bit hard to see, but I'll explain it briefly. On the left-hand axis here, we have all of the individuals uh, and on uh, the bottom axis here, we have a score from negative four to six uh, with a middle line here where it changes from red to blue, uh, which is zero. So individuals that are to the left of this line uh, that are red are less exploratory and individuals that are, that are to the right of this line are more exploratory. So, uh, and uh, the bars here are error bars. So uh, it represents how, um, how uh, likely that is uh, to be their score. So we can see that there is a variation. So there's a spread between individuals where we have some people, some individuals at the top here in blue that are more exploratory. Uh, and we do have some individuals here at the bottom that are less exploratory. And we know from uh, our value here that's significant that uh, these individuals are significantly, uh, there is significant, uh, variation in exploration between individuals. Uh, same thing here with neophobia, uh, where we have uh, to the right uh, in blue here, we have 
individuals that are more neophobic or slower to approach. So their time to approach is longer, most likely. And uh, on the left here in red, we have uh, individuals that are more neophilic. So they're, they're typically faster to approach. Uh, and we do, again, see a variation between individuals. And overall, from a significant O value, we know that uh, there was significant uh, variation in neophobia uh, between the individuals as well. So personality and movement. So again, as I said, uh, we wanted to see if these personality uh, uh, traits and uh, personality uh, traits that we assessed within these individuals are consistent with how they move in a wild environment or if they're related to how they move in a wild environment at all. Uh, and to do this, we uh, collared elephants uh, with GPS collars and tracked them in the forest. Uh, overall, we actually followed all of our elephants, all 31 of them, but uh, we have good data for their movements for 19 individuals uh, for uh, two weeks time where we track their movements over a two week period. Uh, we're still working on kind of uh, doing some of the analysis for this collaring data and comparing it to uh, the problem solving data. But just to give you a brief idea of what it looked like, I just picked some individuals that were um, more exploratory. So uh, from that previous uh, example, I showed you individuals uh, that are in the blue are more exploratory and individuals in the red. So I picked some of those at the extremes. Uh, and oh, sorry, just one of those at the extremes. Uh, so you can see the ones in the blue here, it, kind of the movements of a more exploratory individual. And then on the right is the movements of a less exploratory or not exploratory individual. Um, and obviously we have to kind of assess this uh, statistically to see how much uh, that, how much movement they have and also how much they move uh, in relation to different uh, forest types or human habitation. Uh, similarly with neophobia, uh, in the red is a, a more neophobic individual, uh, neophilic individual in red, uh, and then the blue is a more neophobic individual in their, in their movements. Uh, so we want to, again, assess this in terms of habitat type and proximity to humans, and then also just how much they move in general. So in general, what does this tell us? Uh, we do see individual variation in both exploration and neophobia. Uh, this variation isn't based off of some demographic characteristics uh, like sex, age, or life history, um, at least the ones that we included in our model. Um, and uh, it could mean that uh, the individual variation that we saw in problem solving is based on individual personality traits, uh, not uh, some of these other characteristics. And lastly, uh, applications for this. So uh, this study is able to uh, observe individuals and for behavioral tests and also uh, after we kind of compare it to a movement data, we can kind of assess these individuals and how uh, they move in a wild habitat and see if that, those link up with their behavioral or personality traits. Um, in addition to this, uh, some of the applications for this uh, in a conservation context would be if uh, you're using, say, if one of the ways that you could use personality in a conservation context and why it might be important to understand that is if we know individuals say are more neophobic uh, and you're trying to develop mitigation strategies in order to keep elephants out of the field uh, you, and you can assess that wild population or whichever those cooperating elephants are as being more neophobic or neophilic, say they are more neophobic, uh, we can use that to our advantage often with cooperating and coming up with mitigation methods. One of the problems is cost and maintenance um, if we know they're more neophobic and more opposed to new things, uh, we don't need to spend huge amounts of money on, like, say, a fancy electric fence with a ditch or multiple different ways of doing uh, uh, multiple mitigation methods that are always there. Uh, we could invest more in more variable or more changing uh, mitigation methods that are specifically tailored to that personality types of those cooperating elephants. So uh, it might be more valuable instead of spending costs on a more robust system to have a more varied system. 
Uh, and because animals, we know that animals that are cooperating in that area are more neophobic, uh, having that variability will cause them to uh, be less likely to cooperate, hopefully. That's one way that we potentially could use personality traits, but obviously we would have to test this and uh, assess to see if that actually uh, still would work and how basically adaptive those individuals were. Um, and yeah. Uh, in addition to that, one of the other future applications uh, in terms of both understanding exploration and neophobia uh, with other applications could be used if you're reintroducing wild, uh, sorry, if you're reintroducing captive elephants into the wild. So for reintroductions, it could be important knowing how exploratory an, how exploratory an individual is, because exploration could be very valuable in finding resources and being successful in finding resources. So understanding if an individual is more exploratory or less exploratory could influence how well they would be reintroduced or how successful they are when they're reintroduced. Um, also with neophobia and neophilia, if an individual, as I said before, was more neophobic, it might be less likely to interact with people. Uh, so in terms of reintroduction and causing conflict and problems with uh, different groups or human habitation, uh, knowing if an individual is neophobic or neophilic could be valuable in a reintroduction sense. So uh, for my acknowledgments, I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, both uh, Dr. Plotnick and Dr. Goldenberg, uh, Dr. Peter Weinberg at the Smithsonian, uh, everybody at the Creative Cognition, the Conservation Lab and uh, all of these other um, organizations that help with the funding and uh, maintenance of the project. And thanks. Thanks, Satish. Uh, fantastic talk and um, very, very, very interesting. Um, I, I think just thinking of our project area in, um, in and around Khao Yai, the individuals that cooperate are well known and known by name, so it could be very useful. And you hear about this all the way across India; they're well known and, and known by name, so it could be very, very useful. Um, the one question I had is, why do you think well, the thing that was very interesting, and I, I don't know if you have a, have an answer for this, it, why do you think that elephants they didn't solve more than two tests? um per per run i i understand why um actually the the reach test may have been the most uh the most uh easily solved because elephants stick their trunk although they pull things as well but they stick their trunks in holes all the time but i wonder why i wonder if there's a personality trait did you find any difference in personality traits depending on on which problem they solved yeah so um at least from what we got uh we didn't I don't know if I have a specific answer on if there are certain personalities that solve certain tests, um, because a majority of them did solve the reach tests first. Uh, what we did find that was really interesting with that was that one, that they could definitely uh, solve all three. So the first, we, we tested it on two elephants in Myanmar uh, that weren't included in the analysis. And those two elephants did solve all three tasks and actually fairly quickly. They're both uh, male elephants. One was older, one was younger. Um, and uh, it was interesting because when we did the initial uh, pretest with them, we, we thought, oh, okay, they they were able to get all three and it should be pretty easy for them. But then when we tested uh, basically all the other elephants, um, pretty much all of them were pretty averse to the paper. Uh, and I think that's mostly because uh, they just don't interact with paper very much. Um, there's not really any kind of paper that's in that area. Um, this is paper that we got in Myanmar that's available there, but um, there's not really any reason why they would interact with paper. Whereas like chains and uh, ropes, they do interact with. So it wouldn't be that uncommon uh, pulling on chains or ropes just for, for them being there and interacting with them. And then, uh, as you said, with the reach task, like they do reach into lots of different areas. Uh, it's pretty common for them to do that. So. Uh, that that was definitely something that was interesting. But what was interesting also was that the zoo elephants that we found that we tested uh, at the National Zoo uh, all interacted with the paper first because they uh, often interacted with paper to cover things up 
uh, or obscure things. And they all basically ate the paper first. So uh, it was a very specific thing with them. So paper was is something that's often used in their enrichment or something. Uh, in the, the the two elephants you pre-tested, were they were they Yangong Zoo or were they Nifado or where, where were they? No, they were also the same. Uh, okay. Uh, the same uh, MT elephants, so the Tinguamba uh, elephants. We just uh, since we did them as a pre-test, we didn't include them in the uh, okay. elephants. Cool. Okay, interesting. Right. Um, Dr. Nisa, is there, do you have any questions on the Facebook that you would like to ask? Um, let's see. So I think earlier on, Dr. Farina from last week, she asked about tips and like, do you have any tips on for her for studying wild elephants in Sabah, correct? <laughs> in Sabah. Yep. So that was the only one that I saw. Yeah. Um, let's see. I think with wild, I'm not that familiar with the wild elephants in Saba, but I would say, uh, at least from the studies that we've done, it's really important to uh, understand the individual elephants that you have in that area and also how they interact with different things. So uh, for instance, if you're doing anything in Saba, it might be interesting to see how they interact with different objects or different situations. Uh, and uh, at least definitely from the tests that we did both at the zoo and with the elephants in Yama, and I know this is consistent over like different elephants I've worked with in different locations, that for each of those specific regional variations, you'll have very different variations in how they behave and how they react to different types of stimuli. Uh, so those elephants in Saba, uh, you can definitely compare to other studies or other places in like say India or Myanmar or Thailand, uh, but uh, you might have some variations with those elephants in Sabah that you can look at that are very specific to that area uh, and how they interact with people and, uh, and crop breeding in that area. So uh, definitely look at uh, variations between those individuals and see if there's uh, variations in how they interact with people. If you can. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> she she knows her elephants there well so from yesterday from last week's talk anyway, so she should be able to do that. Thank you. Um, yeah. Any more questions, Nisa? Yep. So just now, so the question from Hannah Meadow, she asked, well, "Were there any age or sex trends in your studies, and how sp stable do you think these ex exploratory?" slash neophobic reactions are within individuals over time. And um, yeah, just to so, let you know that Hannah Meadow is a, is, a, is a pseudonym for somebody who knows elephants very well. It's a, her real name is Hannah Mumby. You, you may have met her. Yeah, I've, I've met Hannah, Hannah briefly in India once, uh, but I know a lot about her work. Uh, so, um, but uh, yeah, so we did see uh, variation slightly with Asian sex, but it wasn't significant. So I think uh, with a model with uh, exploration, we saw that uh, younger elephants tend to be, had like a slight tendency to be more exploratory than older elephants. Uh, and we also saw, I think also a slight tendency for younger elephants to be a little bit, to approach a little bit faster, but it wasn't significantly so. Uh, and then also with uh, sex, uh, we didn't actually see a variation between uh, sex, which I was thinking that it might be uh, more of a variation. So that wasn't significant. That ended up being kind of near the middle. And uh, with, um, yeah, so the other one that we thought would be, uh, the other demographic that we thought might have an influence would be as if they were born in the wild or in captivity, uh, because maybe how they interacted or how kind of, we thought maybe that wild influence from when before being caught in the wild uh, or how their life history was might have an influence in how they behave. Um, but also that didn't show any variation. And that could be because like, MT is very consistent, as you know, of like how they manage their elephants and having fairly strict like uh, training and uh, management of how their elephants are. Um, and I forgot, what, there was a second part of that question. 
Yep. So the second the second part said, um, how stable do you think these exploratory or neophobic reactions are within individuals over time? Yeah, so that is one thing that we didn't test for in this, uh, just timing wise and uh, how much access we had to the elephants at the time. Uh, it's something that we wanted to kind of kind of go over more, uh, but uh, we were only able to test these elephants uh, twice uh, with the novel object. And we uh, also wanted to see, so uh, we wanted to keep it to just two times, at least for this novel object, because we wanted it to still be novel, but uh, have some consistent uh, record of how they interacted with it. Uh, but uh, we do, we would want to uh, obviously test them more in different contexts with potentially a different novel object in order to see uh, if those are still more consistent over time and context uh, to get a better idea of how, how consistent these individuals are for those behavior traits. So I guess this is more of just the beginning of what we kind of would be looking at for these personality traits, but Well, thank you very much, Atis. Um, let, let's hope you can go back soon. Unfortunately, it doesn't look uh, viable yeah. for a little while for, for various different reasons, unfortunately. Yeah. Anything else, Nisa? Uh, nothing else on Facebook. <laughs> wow, that's a that's a big stein you've got there. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a NASA stein. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Satish. That was a, a fa fascinating work and a, a great, um, a great talk. And I'm very, very happy that we were we were finally able, able to snag you and, and get get the talk from you. Um, yep. So all that remains for me to say is thank you to our sponsors, Anantara Golden Triangle. This isn't a fake background. If I move around, you you can't see the the pixelation around me. They've allowed me to sit up here in the bar and to to do these and to look after look after our elephants. Uh, to remind everybody that our lockdown live streams are still going, so I'll be back at 7.30 tomorrow morning and 4 o'clock in the afternoon uh, to do a live stream with our elephants, and um, we may introduce some novel objects and see what happens. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm not a novel object. That They know me a lot, so how they approach me, they all, they all do approach me, and I, I do swear that they do have different personalities, so it's, it's great to be able to test those things. And if you ever want, well, you know where we are, and Josh knows where we are, so if you ever want to come and test, I, do, I would love to do a puzzle box in one of our free roaming areas and see if one of ours can get three. I would like to think they could, because they're um, more used to, they're more used to enrichment, yeah. more used, even though they, 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 don't, they don't go out too deep into the forest at night, but then they all are more used to enrichment. But it'd be very interesting to find out. Uh, so we may nick your design. Um, and yep, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much. And um, if you have any final words, what would you like to say? No, thanks, uh, John and uh, Nisa. And then um, if anybody has any questions that is watching this later, uh, feel free to like comment or send me an email. Uh, I think I have my email. I can put it up really quick, sorry. If anyone comments, we'll send you. We'll send it to you. That's easy. Oh, yeah. going back up. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Satish. <laughs> there we go. If anybody has any uh, questions or uh, comments, you can uh, definitely comment and I'll keep an eye on the chat uh, later on. Okay. Well, thank you very okay. much. And um, yes, thank we'll you. see you all sometime.